to come here today to talk to you about leadership and general practice. And I know that each of us has a different definition when I say the word leadership. And way back when, you may have had this idea of crowds of people and some deity-like person standing at the front, leading them and showing them the way. And I'm pretty sure most of our definitions have changed today. Um, for me, leadership was more about managing complexity. So our NHS is full of complex situations. Our clinical environment is full of complex situations. And being able to manage them effectively, I think, shows good leadership. Now, what I thought I'd do is talk to you about my past year, but really leave a lot of time for questions. And then you can decide if it sums up leadership or not. So I spent the last year doing a fellowship, a Darcy fellowship. What that involves for anyone who hasn't come across it is you get the chance to spend a year with a senior team in an organisation. So whether that organisation is a trust, like Imperial here, and you spend it with the clinical and medical directors, or you're an institute like the Institute of Child Health, or a CCG, or in my case, with Health Education North West London, what used to be the London Deanery is now a let be. So I got to spend the year with the senior team at the Deanery. No, I'm quite happy with my colour scheme. Okay. Um, with the senior team at the London Deanery and work alongside them, looking at how they made their decisions with regards to not just us, so not just doctors and clinicians, but physiotherapists, pharmacists, everyone in the Northwest London region. I got to input into those projects. I got asked about my own ideas. And alongside that, I also had the opportunity to then expand a bit out of my original remit. And these are just a few of the organisations and stakeholders that I had the chance to work alongside, along with Health Education Northwest London, Imperial being one of them. The interesting one for me is the one in the bottom right corner, Bucks University. They do a nursing undergraduate programme, and coming from a medical background, I had no idea about nurses and how they worked and how they were trained. And the idea was to redevelop their undergraduate programme to encourage more of them to become practice nurses and work out in the community and draw them away from the bright lights of ITU. So it was a real challenge for me, but it was really exciting again. Um, and that's a little off glimpse into things. Now, as part of the Darcy Fellowship, just to give you an idea, you do spend a year with the senior team but you only spend three days a week with them, so half your week. So I spent half my week at Henwell at the Deanery. The other half I spent doing clinical work. Um, Darcy Fellows were made up of not just GPs, they're made up of hospital doctors, physios, pharmacists, there was a paramedic. And so your other half of the week can be whatever you want. You can go home and have fun, you can do some of your clinical work, you can do a bit of research. The other thing that they offer is one day approximately a month, you get a study day where you all come together as Darcy Fellows. And as part of that, you learn about the politics around the NHS, the workings of a senior team, management, leadership, and you gain a postgraduate certificate as a result of that. So you come out of the year with not just experience and having met a whole host of organisations, but also with something to put on your CV. Now, Darcy Fellowships aren't the only fellowships out there. Um, you can also do fellowships in education. You can do fellowships in research or academia. And you can do fellowships in public health, uh, with Public Health England. The other fellowship is the fellowship with the Faculty of Medicine, where you work with Sir Bruce Keogh. All of those fellowships uh, have information online. I'm happy to answer questions on any of them. The only thing to note is that the Darcy and Faculty of Medicine Fellowship run strictly from September to September each academic year. The other ones are a little bit more flexible. You can do them when you're in training or post CCT, it doesn't matter. Um, so I spoke about how to me leadership meant managing complexity. I think it also means redeveloping and having innovative ideas. So not just using the same old tools that have worked before and you know, trying to use them again, but trying to find new ways and new tools. So 
on that note, um, a few of us fellows got together this year and what we did was we decided to develop a conference, the first of its kind, where the four let be, so the three London and KSS, got together to say, if you're interested in education, if you're at the top of your game, if you're a senior educator somewhere, come to our conference, learn a bit more, learn from each other. We also had workshops on interprofessional learning and it was innovative because the entire conference was put together by fellows across the four Let Bees. The funding obviously came from the Let Bees themselves. We had initially a capacity for 100 delegates. We had to increase that twice and ended up with over 300. We had workshops going, I think there were 13 in the end. And overall, the feedback's been very positive. It was initially a pilot program we've now submitted to ASME and DMAC um, in terms of our abstract. It really doesn't like my color scheme. <laughs> and HEE, Health Education England, have now said, we, we like the idea of your pilot. Um, can we take it nationally? So that's just, again, an example of how you can use your year to develop an idea that you might have. And there's always support and colleagues around you to take that idea further. The other thing that I noted, um, not only as a GP, but also as a fellow, is support. And the idea that as a GP, you often work single-handedly and there isn't much support around you. As a fellow in your organisation, you might be the only person in that organisation. So where is the support? In the DARSI programme, we came together every month, but other fellows, I've talked about other fellowships, where do they get their support from? So again, at, the, at what used to be the deanery, a few of us fellows got together and said, right, why don't we set up a network for the fellows across London, and again, KSS included. And what we did was we set up monthly education meetings for any fellow in the four South East Let Bees. The idea was that not only does it provide an education forum, sorry, there shouldn't be question marks there, um, an education forum um, based on the Academy of Medicine's uh, framework, but also a networking opportunity. It also provided a regional meeting for them to present their work at that they'd been doing throughout their year. We set up a Twitter group so that you could then let every other fellow in the region know about free conferences, free events, interesting, exciting opportunities that were going on because that wasn't available before. So how did we find out about things? Um, in terms of sustainability, that was something that really came out from the year. Now that the year's over, how does this particular programme continue? And the answer is that there's fellows coming through every year. So we've basically passed the baton on and the programme's now going forward. Our next meeting's on the 24th of September. Where do I go from here though? Um, and was it really worth my while doing a fellowship or doing the Darcy program? My answer is a definitive yes. It gave me the opportunity to see a side of the NHS that I had never encountered before in medical school or as a GP. It was exciting. I got to do education and I'm continuing that on um, here and at another London university that shall be named on these hallowed grounds. <laughs> um, I'm still doing my clinical work. I'm still collaborating with some of the organisations that I came across and I'm feeding back into the DARSI programme to try and develop their curriculum for future fellows. So it really is to infinity and beyond. The opportunities are endless if you can find them and make the most of them and are interested in them. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. So essentially, as I said, you can take the fellowship on either in training or post CCT. I did my fellowship as an ST4, so a bolt on to my three years as a GP trainee. So essentially, it doesn't matter either way. Three days a week is spent doing your fellowship programme and the other half of the week, so two days will be spent doing your clinical work, whatever that clinical work may be, GP or hospital based. It balances out quite nicely, um, whether you're post-CCT or in training. Most hospital and trainee doctors will take what's called an UP out of programme experience, which you just apply to your LEP for. 
That's right. Because if you want to do this as an ST4, you have to um, go on filling in your workplace-based assessment, yes. your amount of hours, all the stuff that belongs to the RCGP. If you take your CCT, you then need to find a practice to host you, but usually you'll get some help with that. So you've done it both ways at the left end. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Good question. That's a really good question. So uh, the Faculty of Medicine, the Bruce Keogh Fellowships and the Darcy Fellowships are normally advertised around March, April, depending on the organisation, because they run from September to September. The other fellowships, because they're more variable in their start date, um, will come out at any point during the year. Places to look, so for instance, if you wanted to work with Imperial, you just look on the Imperial website, the university website. Um, NHS jobs, jobs.ac.uk is another place as well. Um, and they're the main places where you'll find the programmes. Each programme itself will obviously have um, its own information. Or you can find our London Twitter group and we'd be more than happy to help you. We're at London Fellows, by the way. <laughs> can I ask you one, Natasha? You, yeah. you mentioned the support group for the London Fellows. Earlier on, we were talking about support for newly qualified GPs, but have you done some work on that as well? Yes, yeah, so essentially, um, <coughs> I've been working with the RCGP to look at if you move areas post, uh, post BTS, how do you find a support group? And we're looking into linking up support groups across, well, London at the moment, but hopefully nationally, so that if you do move, you can find your first five group. At the moment, if you want a support group, if you contact the RCGP, they have a list, uh, not a full list, of first five groups across London. Um, the other way to do it is you can contact um, the VTS locally and find out about first five groups. But at the moment, it's not formalised, so we're, we're still working on that, unfortunately. But it's something to certainly look into. Um, obviously, there are Facebook groups and Twitter groups, but sometimes just talking to people is, is worth a lot. So if you're in a practice or you've got to a new area and you're locoming, find out who the young salaried people are and talk to them. They'll know about their area, they'll know about their first five groups, they'll be able to link you up and most people are happy to do that to someone that's new to the area because we all know how lonely GP can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially, so I haven't done one of those, but what it involves is, it's similar to the Dalsy program, but it's sponsored by Professor, so I need to get that in the right order, Bruce Keogh. Uh, it's done through the Faculty of Medicine. If you go to their website, they've got information on it. They also have a list of their previous um, fellows on there. And my suggestion would be to contact them and say, what was your year like? They also spend time with senior teams. So, for instance, they'll spend time with, um, the name's just escaped me, the, uh, what's the governing body that govern GP practices called? The LNC. The, no. The uh, NHS, uh, NHS England. The they do spend time with NHS England, and they also spend it with, I was trying to think of um, exciting organisations, and it's, um, They'll come back to me at three in the morning, I'm sure. Um, but essentially, with, um, with different organisations as well, uh, so not just within, you're right, NHS England, but not just within NHS, but uh, the monitoring agents that run alongside them. So they do a similar programme to the Darcy programme. Um, you've got to apply again, you've got to go through interview, and the information will be on the Faculty of Medicine website, um, along with the contact details of the fellows. If you have any trouble finding them, let me know and I can put you in touch with a few of them. That's not a problem at all. Um, how many fellowships are there within the ones that you were doing and how competitive are they? What are you looking for? You mean how many Darcy fellows are there or how many? So, the ones that you were talking about, but not necessarily the faculty medicine ones. But... So within the Darcy programme this year, they actually doubled. So they had 60 fellows this year. And as I say, it was multi-professional. Um, if you go into public health, education, academia, it varies depending on which organisation has funds to be able to take them on. So the deanery also takes on um, educational fellows, for instance. 
um, trusts do the same, so Imperial has educational fellows here. Um, the Faculty of Medicine Fellowship has about, so they have fewer, I'd say about 10 to 20 each year. Um, how competitive is it? Again, um, it is a competitive process, but it varies as to who's applying when. Most people will come in with some sort of interest, some sort of work experience, um, something that they've done to show that you know, they're interested. If you pick up um, any of the job adverts, they'll come with something called a job description. Read through the job description and just try and tick as many boxes as you can and try and find something. I guarantee that uh, even as trainees, you'll have something in there that will tick those boxes. Um, if it's a teaching experience that you've done, if it's something on the ward, if it's how you've helped a patient, if it's you've organised your timetable, you've noticed that there's something wrong and you've done a quality improvement project, all those things count, so don't forget them. Um, and all your out-of-hospital things as well. So if you've done any charity work, it's, it's far more interesting for the interview panel to hear about that because it will make you stand out a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome Chad Hockey, Dr. Chad Hockey, who's um, just qualified as a GP. Actually, Chad, you need one of those. Oh. Yeah, just, you just... Yeah, yeah. I'm impressed that you're all still here, actually. If, uh, if I was um, at a meeting like this pre-lunch time, I think I probably would have slipped out the back doors for a clinical leadership session. It probably wouldn't have ticked my boxes, um, but uh, there we go. So, so my name's uh, Chad. I'm a, um, a newly qualified salary GP working in Hampsworth and Fulham. Um, I've got a background in nursing, actually, so I've been a nurse for about 25 years and uh, retrained in medicine <clears throat> and just went straight through foundation training then in, into GP straight after foundation training and just qualified from the imperial scheme um, here just a month, a month ago. Um, so I think I've been asked to speak today because tomorrow I, I start a Darcy Fellowship in Clinical Leadership. So um, it's, it's possible that I might be able to give a perspective of someone that's a newly qualified trainee and the route that I've taken to get to, to where I am. <clears throat> Sorry, can I just get rid of this? Yeah. If you just put that, that one, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the, these are the things that are specifically asked to cover um, for, the, for the session. So it's the hows and whys, and I thought there'd be senior uh, clinical staff here plus medical students, so I, I thought I'd try and throw something in there that uh, would be useful to everybody irrespective of their experience level. And I guess it, it starts off with this, really, when you think about a career. You know, who, who do you want to be? Where are you trying to aim for? Um, and I think that our ideas about who we want to become are, are influenced by the portrayal of a profession in the media and our experiences as we go through our careers, but also our exposure to role models. So if you'd asked me three years ago, did I want to go into clinical leadership? It wasn't even on my radar. I remember when I applied for um, GP training, I made a list on a four bit of paper of all the various medical specialties, and I went down them and crossed them all off one by one. <clears throat> Surgery didn't make it onto the paper, by the way. Um, and, and I was left with a short list but looking back on it, clinical leadership, which is what I'm about to embark on, wasn't even on that bit of April paper. And I think that's probably because I wasn't exposed to role models that would have given me that kind of vision. So, yeah, ER, definitely, we all know. Um, but the other uh, face up here, probably a bit less familiar. And even though when I was putting my GP application in, she was the sixth most influential woman in the, in the UK. So this is Professor Dame Sally Davies, who is the first female chief medical officer. 
Uh, she was, or possibly still is, a professor of the hematology at Imperial. I don't know if any of you have met her, I haven't. Um, <clears throat> hands up at the front. Um, and she, she went on to um, advise the government about the research and completely revolutionised the way that research is carried out in Britain. So anyone that's on an academic programme here has got her to thank because she set up the National Institutes of Health Research. And it was her vision and uh, drive that enabled that to happen. So, so if you think about there being a clinical leadership role model, you know, three years ago, I, I didn't know her. She wasn't there for me, which is probably why it wasn't really on my radar as a, as a profession. <coughs> if I'm honest, I think at that time, as I said, clinical leadership was, was probably quite boring. It didn't really excite me, which is why I'm impressed that you're here before lunch. So, so what changed? Uh, why have I had that U-turn? I mean, it was probably all the things that I thought it wasn't um, are the things that have attracted me to it. So I didn't think it was vocational. I didn't think that uh, it was clinical. Um, <clears throat> and I started here as a, um, on the first cohort of GP trainees on the Imperial Scheme. And I could see how much work all of the program directors and the team had put into it. Uh, and I really wanted to make it a success for, for the scheme and for future trainees. And so every placement I went through, I tried to do something which would try and develop the post for the people coming through and, it, and would showcase it. And I, I just felt like I had that duty to, to do the best I could for, for, the, for the scheme. And <clears throat> so if there's any, are there any medical students here? I didn't see the initial attendance. But if you're thinking about um, becoming a, a GP, um, I'll just say that the Imperial Scheme, I really would recommend it to you. I mean, there's placements at Public Health England, I had a placement at the King's Fund. It's the, it's the kind of opportunities that you will not find on any, any other scheme in, in, um, in the UK, I don't think. Um, certainly not in London. So they go, tick the box for Imperial when you're doing your GP applications. Um, <clears throat> but so, so I started doing projects, basically, on my, on my placements. Some of them were posts which uh, had a bit of supported time. Um, Others weren't, so I think I did 17 in total. I counted them, them up the other day. Um, for example, when I was doing my obstetric um, placement, which was an incredibly busy post, um, I realised that the gynaecology SHO was carrying the bleep to cover A&E. Uh, this is at Queen Charlotte's, the Hammersmith. Um, they covered the obstetric triage area. Um, they covered the wards. It's just ridiculously busy. Um, so you had to be in three places at once. <coughs> But on the obstetric triage area, so I'd be a newly started, it was my second day I was on call, I was being called to see a woman that's 34 weeks with reduced fetal movements. And I had the faintest idea how to manage that or what to do about it. But I was also done in A&E at the same time, trying to deal with a woman having a miscarriage and being bleeped to come up to the ward. And, and there's two midwives sat on the obstetric walk-in unit, very, very experienced. They could do it with their eyes closed bleeping me constantly saying, come on, when are you going to come, when are you going to come, when are you going to come? And so I thought, well, this, this is ridiculous. It has to, has to change as a better form of service provision. Um, but there's no evidence. So um, <clears throat> in that very busy job, I sat and collected all the evidence and came up with uh, a month's worth of data, which I then presented um, to the heads of midwifery I looked at the, and the, the heads of obstetrics. I looked at regional practice, what happens in other midwifery-led units. Um, I looked at any obstacles for development of practice, the cases that came through. And it was, it was pretty much untenable for there to not be a change at the, at the end of it. But it was done in a supported way. So there was then a consultant dedicated to help develop midwifery practice. The gynaecologist at HO no longer carried the bleep to cover that unit. It was passed on. So it resulted in a clear change to practice. Um, so it was about that sort of time that made me think, actually, we can either just leave it as it is and it'll be like this for the next lot coming through or else we can try and make it a bit better. But it's about taking some sort of action. <clears throat> um, so I think it was my perspective on what clinical leadership was that started to change and particularly at the King's Fund post. So it's an amazing environment. I mean, it's imagine, I guess the equivalent, clinical equivalent would be if you're on a, on a ward and you had a microbiologist and a radiologist um, and all the therapists that you could want and social workers all in the same office with you. So that it wasn't an MDT that you're going to to see them once a week. 
yeah, they're there with you. You might be able to question, you just go and ask them. And, that, and that's kind of how the, how the office is set up. You've got you know, the economists, statisticians, everyone in the same place. So it's a lesson to be learned for NHS possibly from, from that side of it. But what they don't have is the clinical background. So they've got all the knowledge and the ideas, but they can't really contextualize that clinically, which is what I could do. And it's what actually often happened. They'd come to me with a clinical question or how, does this, how would this pan out? What's the reality of how this would work? So it made me realize actually that there's a role for, um, for clinicians to actually translate things, um, to translate ideas into, into practice. And I guess it comes down to this, it's about making a difference. So, so this is uh, from the Longer Lives um, campaign, I suppose, on Public Health England. Uh, and this graphic looks at um, overall premature deaths in um, 324 boroughs across, uh, across England. Um, so premature death is defined as death under the age of 75. And you can see Hammersmith and Fulham there is a little island of red um, surrounded by green. So to give you the stats on it, uh, Hampshire and Fulham, we, we come 239th out of 324 boroughs in the UK with 377 premature deaths per 100,000 people. Kensington and Chelsea, just, ne just next door to us, they come 18th. So 257 premature deaths per 100,000. Okay. So you, you can go online and there's the link there, break it all down. But for a public health doctor, that's statistics, and you know, they could give you perhaps some of the inequality measures on there. But, but for me, I've worked in Kensington and Chelsea. I know the people that live there, and I know that the way the services are provided, and, I, and the same thing for Hammersmith and Fulham. So I can actually translate that a bit further down onto a practical clinical level. I've got that link between the theory and what's actually happening on the ground. So <clears throat> I put that up because it's, it just means that you know, as, as a clinician, you, you probably won't make any impact on that. But if you're going in clinical leadership, you might, you might well do. Have you thought in the back that that reflects quite tightly where they have got in in the last session? So that's 2011 to 2013, the data on this one, I think. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so it comes down to engagement. So, so this is this slide I've taken from a King's Fund uh, piece of work, which looked at how engaged GPs were with um, CCGs. So it's a three-year study. This was from year two, um, and the idea, one of the ideas of the study, was that uh, it would show how much control GPs felt they had on shaping local services. And so you can see from here that from year one to year two of the study, uh, there's a statistically significant decrease in the level of engagement of GPs. So it's dropped from 19 down to 12% with how they feel, they're, they're, how engaged they are with the work, role of the, the CC, their role within the CCG. Um, <clears throat> So I was actually involved in planning part of this study for, for um, this, this second year, but I um, wasn't involved in anything more than that. Uh, and uh, then the results came out after, long after I left the King's Fund. I was doing stroke <coughs> medicine here. I was on night shifts and then had a, um, a phone call. Would I mind going to a King's Fund conference the next day to, um, to present at the conference a GP response to these, um, to these results? So pr pretty short notice and for me pretty daunting to go to a, a sort of national conference and I was told that it's going to be people from 10 Downing Street and all sorts. So it's, it was a big, big jump in what I was used to. <coughs> and it wasn't that they wanted me, it was just that the person they had had pulled out. And I just happened to be someone that they thought they, a mug that they thought they could rope in at the last minute, I think. Um, <coughs> so, so I looked at the, the work actually and the respondents and, and when you broke it down, they were actually saying that about 70% of GPs felt at least moderately engaged with CCGs. And I looked at the people I knew that were working as GPs and GP trainees, and it just didn't ring true that 70% of GPs would feel actually engaged with a CCG. So I, I looked at the respondents, and in fact, only 12% of their respondents were salaried doctors, salaried GPs, and 30% had a formal CCG role already. If you, if you think about it, 
most GP, about 80% of GP trainees now are female. Most female GPs, it's a fact, go on to become salary doctors, go on to work part-time. So, so this actually, is this the voice of female general practice, a part-time salary general practice, about this engagement? They, they didn't, didn't even fill the forms in to, to give an answer. Or is it that actually it's being led by um, senior male cohorts of staff? I, I, I don't know. So I presented this sort of question at, at this conference. I mean, I know that there are some practices, there'll be as a, a partner will be delegated to do diabetes, someone else will take over warfarin and anti chiro clinics, and someone else will be, do, be the, the, the lead for CCG work. And that means the rest of the partners can sort of take that off their shoulders. So that, that, that wasn't factored in either. So all these sort of ground level type things weren't really coming out in the research. So, so I felt actually it went quite well as a stand-in last-minute talk. I was asked to mention the highs and lows, and that was definitely a bit of a high. And then I had to go and sit at the sort of breakout group where you have a group discussion, a little table, everyone sits together. And I was seated with a chair of a CCG, somebody who was high up in the Royal College of General Practice, uh, and there was a professor of primary care from the north of England somewhere. And there was a retired professor from Kent, a professor of sociology, and, it, and the, the contrast couldn't have been greater. Um, I've never been made to feel less welcome in my entire life than I was at that meeting, at that table. Uh, it wasn't that my views weren't um, wanted. I wasn't wanted. They couldn't see past the word trainee. And it was the same for this professor that was retired. Um, they couldn't see past the word retired. He was of no consequence to, to that discussion. It ended up as being a networking meeting. So all, all of the things which I thought um, had my preconceptions about clinical leadership were kind of being you know, played out in front of me at, 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 that, uh, at that table. So I came out of it actually not wanting to get involved at all um, with this kind of thing. Um, but, and there's, there's some work actually that's saying that G GPs do, do need to be grounded and um, have at least some clinical work in order to be able to be respected. And, and I guess that was kind of what I was picking up and why it wasn't really uh, working for me when I was at that, at that, at that conference. Um, but the, the fact is that it's changing and someone is going to change it. And so if we don't get involved and try and um, put our voice in there, it's, you're just going to be carried along with it and possibly consumed by it. So I don't think you can hide from, from, from change at the moment. Okay, so, so finding, finding a job. <clears throat> so I guess that this is where this com, comes in, really, because um, not, not getting involved, like I say, it's not really an option, but where, where do you start to get involved? And this article is from B&J Careers, um, and you can see the, the bottom part of the paragraph. Um, Unless we support GPs to become a future cadre of clinical leaders, the NHS will fail to perform in the future. So it's pretty, pretty bleak. Um, and, and there's no real answer as to where the next generation is going to come from. I mean, you've got schemes, you've heard about the Darcy Fellowship. I'm going to be sacrilegious now, and my opinion is that I think it's having these schemes is almost an admission of failure. Um, because I, I, it sort of sets it up as being a separate role. It's like you can do clinical leadership if you go and do a training post to go and do it. I know that there are some areas, for example, Luton has got a scheme that future leaders of the NHS. Um, so for the future of general practice in the NHS, we do a three-year post. And they're coming up locally. There are schemes coming up, but they're, as you've heard, they're, they're not there for everybody. <clears throat> and, and, I, and I wonder, actually, if that's the right way to do it. Because if you look at how we learn, actually, it's 90% through experience and exposure and 10% through education. And certainly for me... <coughs> The projects that I did, I felt like I took on a bit more responsibility each time. Um, I used my training to get in, to do those projects, and, and that was all about experience. And I was sort of gradually doing a little bit more and t pushing the boundaries a bit more in what I was in what I was doing. Um, and so, so I wonder if that's what we should be doing to think about future leaders, rather than relying on individual set schemes. And and that's the top part of that is actually the tip of the iceberg. Because underneath there, you've got all the more complex things, which perhaps don't get taught quite so well, but involve us all as individuals. 
And right at the very bottom is motive. So for me, I really wanted to make the scheme better. I wanted the next trainees coming through to have really good placements, and I wanted to pay back the work done by the programme directors, which is why I did the projects I did. So it was about wanting to help people and create something. I, I kind of wanted to make myself redundant, like set it up, it's there, it's functional, it's working. The next people, it's then running for them. It wasn't about personal achievement, it was about this whole side on the right hand side of the, of the picture, about enabling people. And that for me is the attractive thing about clinical leadership, because I think it's about nurturing and it uses you as an individual, all your individual traits and your experience through life, not just in medical training. Um, and it's not just the little top bit. Um, so nearly finished, this is the final slide. Uh, and, I, and I put this one up, this has come out recently. Has anyone read this one? So um, I, I was a bit worried about putting this up actually because the prof's on it and he comes in number 38. Um, and he's not here. Because um, I was gonna mention number 14, who is second row uh, down, fourth from the left, which is Zoe Norris, who's coming in at number 14. And has anyone read her blogs? So, so she, she basically has come to prominence, 14th most influential GP from writing blogs. Um, and they're phenomenal blogs. I mean, if anyone's thinking about career in general practice and they haven't read you know, what it's like in frontline general practice, I'd recommend reading some of her blogs. But it just shows you, you don't have to go down that same route. You, know, you can actually be a bit more creative. And she, she's now doing work in clinical leadership. So you, you can you can forge your own path through it, I suppose is the message from this one. So there we go, I hope I've covered those questions. And if anyone's got anything they want to ask, I'm happy to take questions, unlike this guy. <laughs> Um, so, so tomorrow I'm doing, um, so the, the, the remit is I'll do three days a week um, clinical, or sorry, three sessions a week, sorry, clinical, and then six sessions a week working for Hammersmith and Fulham CCG um, as part of the, the DASI Fellowship. So I'll do the breakouts uh, once a month to go to the uh, educational sessions. And um, in terms of what I'm actually going to be doing at Hammersmith and Fulham CCG, that's still up in the air a little bit. There's several projects that are going on. Um, but the, essentially the role is trying to translate some of the theory and the vision about how to make services better for people down into practice uh, on, on a practical level to do something which, is, which, which works. Okay, so I'll hand over to James. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome James Kavanagh. And you are knighted, but you do need to be knighted. I need that. I, okay. I, okay. You've all missed an opportunity there. I've worked with Chad, and I'm going to have the great fortune of working with him again. And some of you will never meet him again. And he is one of the most experienced and thoughtful doctors I've ever worked with. And as human beings, I'd say that's why I don't want to make him blush. And you had a chance to ask him a question. And you'll probably never have that chance again. <laughs> so, bad luck. Um, hello, my name's James, and I'm a GP, and um, I just wanted to say that it's really good to be here, it's lovely to see you all, and I've been asked to talk about clinical leadership, and um, it's a difficult one because I think you're all at a stage in your career where lots of people are telling you what to do, and I don't want to uh, be put on that list. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I got to the position I'm in. But before I get in to tell you the position I'm in, um, I just wanted to congratulate you all and just say you're really, really lucky if you're going to be GPs. It's, uh, it sounds a bit trite, but it's a fantastic job. It's fascinating. I love going to work every day. I work six days a week often, sometimes seven. And there's people around me who work harder than me. And none of them complain about being GPs. They're inspirational, and that's partners, associates, 
healthcare assistants, I work with nurses, I work with administrators, I work with um, all kinds of people, and none of them complain to me about their job. And so I just wanted to flag that up because I don't exist in a void. I, I am exposed to all kinds of environments, and I read, or I used to read the GP mags, and I used to read newspapers, I stopped doing that, and there's a lot of negativity coming your way, or coming our way, and I'd just like to push back on that a bit. I love going to work, I work with great people, I help people every day, and I'm very, very lucky, and you are about to do that if you're not already doing it. And you have to hold on to that, because that is the core of what we do. We work with inspirational, intelligent people to help other people. And you're very lucky to be in a role where you're going to be doing that every day. I hope you can remember that. Right, clinical leadership. Um, I don't really have very good slides. <laughs> That's the thing about coming on, and I don't know how to change them either. That's the thing about coming on after Chad is he's amazing, so um, whatever I was going to do was not going to match up, so I'm, I didn't really do any slides. <laughs> So I should tell you a little about what I do. I'm a t oh, I, is, this I, is this your slide? Well, I've got a few more, but they're rubbish. I mean, they are rubbish. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, at, I'm in the CCG, the evil CCG. Um, who knows what a CCG does? Hands up. I'm really nice. I've had all kinds of counselling. Um, what does a CCG do? Excellent. That's very good. What does commissioning mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. And do you know, just briefly, do you know who did it before CCGs? PCTs. Former chair of the PCTs sat to my right. Um, yeah, so, our, so I'm the vice chair of the CCG and HNF, and um, I work with a team of people and I work with them to commission services, so competitively tender contracts to deliver care. And we, and non-competitively tender, David will say, for hospitals and some other services. So half of the week I sit in offices in Marlebone and I work with a team of really good people and we try and work out how to design contracts that will improve services for patients and develop the providers of those services. That's really what CCGs do. They do some other stuff around developing providers. They do a lot of stuff around managing the contracts, which is difficult because the contracts are tight and providers are having a great deal of difficulty delivering the contracts. When I get boring, please somebody throw something at me. <laughs> And um, I work with a team of people who spend every single day trying to make sure that providers are delivering on these contracts because fundamentally we're spending public money for the public to give them services that makes their health better. And we're accountable to the Audit Commission, we're accountable to NHS England, we're accountable to Monitor. You know, there's a lot of people pressing on us to make sure we deliver services. So that's what I do, it's really strange. I trained as a doctor, my parents were doctors, my dad was among the single-handed GPs in a basement in a place in Kensington. He spent his career doing 11 surgeries a week. He would never have dreamt of doing this stuff. It wasn't his responsibility. But it is our responsibility now, things have changed. And so I'm leading to the point of what is clinical, clinical leadership for me. The, who's read the Health and Social Care Act 2012? Who's read the introduction? <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I've read it um, because it fundamentally changed my job. And I thought, oh, I better read it because this is, this is really strange what's happening. And, and he didn't do a lot of things right, but there's one principle he did get right, that chap, who nobody can remember. I'm not even sure he's an MP anymore. Um, he said that if you're going to design clinical services to deliver care to patients, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you had some clinicians involved, but really involved. And so 
Myself and lots of other people who are clinicians, some of us quite experienced, some of us not so experienced, sit in rooms with managers and all kinds of other types of people, financiers, um, public health consultants, and we discuss how best to try and improve services for patients. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But we are involved. And so for me, clinical leadership is about being around to influence in some way or listen to other people who are trying to influence service design. And that's really exciting and rewarding. It doesn't often work, I have to be honest, but at least we're involved in the conversation. And I get to meet extraordinary people economists, philosophers, people who've spent their entire careers having come out of Oxford with PPEs, managing contracts. It sounds really dull, doesn't it? But it's a game of chess for them. They've got somebody on the other side in the provider area, so let's say Imperial, who is trying to beat them by trying to make sure the contract remains profitable. And we're on the other side trying to make sure that they deliver the quality we've paid for. And it's a game of chess, and it's fascinating. So that's what I do. I'm a CCG vice chair. I, I sit on the CQG, which is a clinical quality group. I chair that for Imperial. So I have lots of interesting conversations with lots of people in Imperial, good people trying to do a very difficult job. And then I also do clinical sessions. I'm, I'm a GP trainee. My, my Morag is here somewhere. Hello, Morag. <laughs> my wonderful registrar. Um, I was lucky enough to be taught by, by Chad. He was my trainee, but he spent most of the time <laughs> teaching me. And um, I had another chat with a couple of other people. I'm not sure they're here. So I do that, which is great, because I get to meet good, intelligent people who've decided to use their intelligence to help other people by becoming doctors. And I learn a lot from them. It's great. So I'd advocate being a trainer. It's really good. Um, so how did I get here? You might be thinking, I don't want to do that. Or, how do I, you know, this clinical leadership, I must get on a clinical leadership program. I have never been, even on an away day, around clinical leadership. <laughs> I've, I've never read an article. I'm supposed to have a coach. You get to certain positions and people knock you on the shoulders and say, you should have a coach. And then you get given a, it's odd, you, this will happen to you, some of you, you get given a brochure of coaches. And it's about, th it's about, it's quite thick, and there's maybe 50 people in there, and they've all got nice photographs, and they say, we coach. And we coach people to do this, that, and the other. And you've got to pick one, and then you've got to go and be coached by them. I don't have a coach. <laughs> but what I have had in my career are amazing mentors. Um, initially, my parents, of course, your parents, your mentor. And then throughout my clinical career, I've tripped over fantastic people and grabbed hold of them and you know, sometimes holding their feet and they're dragging me along. But, but basically you thought, God, you're amazing. You're intelligent or you're, you're, not just, you're socially intelligent, you're emotionally intelligent, you're, logistically you're much, much better than me. I'm going to get as close to you as I possibly can without you know, causing offense. <laughs> and I'm going to listen to you and learn from you and eventually we'll part, you'll get a holding order against me or something. And, I'll find someone else, and I'll attach myself to them. And they're the people who I've learned from, and I hope you'll do the same, because you're going to be in environments where you will be exposed to these amazing people, some of them younger than you, some of them older than you, some of them contemporaries. It doesn't matter. And if I'm going to leave you with any message today, please look around you and find people to be your mentors at different stages in your career. You probably are already doing that doesn't have to be formal. So I currently have a couple of mentors. Um, I work with David Wingfield. He's my partner. He's done more political things than I can list. And he's very adept at working out what is going on politically, which I'm not very good at. But I can go to David and say, this is a situation. I'm trying to work out how I work within this as a commissioner. And he gives me good advice. So I'm very, very lucky to have him. I have other people I go to for other things. And so my role as a clinical leader is partly working out who are the best resources around me to help me in the role that I have, because I can't do it all myself. 
And what can I take from them to make me better at what I do? And, and that's, is that leadership? Because eventually you do have to stand up in front of people and say, we have made this decision. For some of you, that's not going to be great. But we think for the whole, it's going to be better. And then you have to deal with the brickbats when people say, but that's terrible, you've changed something. Why have you changed that? And you have to be able to robustly defend the decision you've made. So, so, so the other thing about leadership, apart from listening to people, learning to learn from people, is to make sure you can defend your decisions and having the guts to stand up in front of people and defend the decision that you've made. Anyway, I'll stop philosophizing a bit. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here, because you think, well, how do you get wind up? You're a partner in a teaching practice, CCG chair, do lots of other things. Um, I'm, uh, this is my career, there you go. I qualified St. Mary's in uh, 1993, went in 89, just after David. Um, my first job was in Dartford. Hands up if you know where Dartford is. It's not a great place. <laughs> I, I certainly didn't get the surgical rotation at St. Mary's. And then from there to Ealing, then to Hammersmith. Um, and then a hospital. I worked in Ealing and Hammersmith Hospital, and in Guy's Hospital, and Chelsea and Westminster. And then I disappeared for a while, and I came back, and I worked at Chelsea and Westminster again, and then I went to Chelsea, and then as a GP, and then I was in Soho as a clinical director of a walk-in center. And then I was lucky enough to be appointed as a partner in a practice in Hammersmith. In between times, I have worked as a paid doctor in Delhi, Darjeeling, Calcutta, Mysore, Dhanamsala, Leh, Cape Town, Windhoek, Kuvalai, Angola, Moana, Botswana, and Kembemba, which is pronounced with a click that I can never get right, um, in the Congo. So I'm, I'm one of that generation of doctors who could disappear stage left and go off and do all kinds of strange things in Africa and India and, and then come back a few years later and get back onto the line. I don't think that happens anymore. And the only reason I put that up is not to kind of boast, but just to say it's a shame that you chaps, I, I'm not sure you have that opportunity to go out and get all kinds of experiences that you can use. But hey-ho, things change. <laughs> um, Currently, these are my roles. I'm a dad, I'm a partner, I'm a trainer, I'm a vice chair of the CCG, I'm president of a horticultural society, chair of an allotment committee, and treasurer of um, a particular organization that runs bike trips for children. Um, that's what I do each week. Um, so what's helped me get here? Luck. I'm really interested in people. I hope you are too, otherwise you shouldn't be doctors. You should be anesthetists. Um, um, I'm very, very lucky to have had very good mentors. I'm sure I've missed a few, but the ones that I've managed to spot have been very useful. And I, I want you to please take that message away. Find some people you like who are better than you. Somebody once said to me, James, try and make sure you're the stupidest person in the room, which isn't hard. And um, if you're ever in a room where you don't think you're the stupidest person in the room, you're probably in the wrong room. Now, I, I didn't understand what he meant at first. I thought he was being rude. But I kind of get it now, because I, I do go into rooms where people who are much better at the things that they do that I'm supposed to be doing. And I try and learn from them. And as a guide for me, that's been very useful, especially in clinical leadership, because I'm new to clinical leadership, or, or am I? I? I've been leading as a clinician since I walked onto the ward on the first day, and the nurse turned around to me and said, what do I do about this? You are all clinical leaders, because that's your role as doctors. So I, I find it difficult to say, well, as a career path, you can become a clinical leader. You are all going to be clinical leaders from the first day you put on the stethoscope and you get paid to do that. It's how you decide to develop it. Um, inheritance and history, I'm very lucky. I was raised by very political people who taught me a lot about Clement Attlee and the post-war government. And my understanding of the politics that led to there being an NHS and how politics has influenced the NHS since then strongly guides what I believe to be the right thing for my patients. If you're not aware of the politics of the NHS and Clement Hatley and the post-war government, I would advise you to have a look at it because it's fundamental to what's happening now 
as it was fundamental to what happened in his country after the war. So that will help you a lot in dark evenings when you're working very hard. And you think, why, the, why am I here? Why did I? I did really well at A-levels. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, so what helps? Luck. I have a very happy home life, and I would advise you to put as more effort into your home life than into your career, because without a happy home life, you won't have a good career. Um, I'm very lucky to be surrounded by excellent colleagues, and I would advise you to try and make that the case for you. Um, and artwork, by art I mean other things, so gardening, I love gardening, but basically gardening is a form of art, it's very comforting. So try and have other interests. I mean, these are obviously generic things. You know all this stuff already. Um, worry less, or your hair will fall out. But also, you will make terrible mistakes as clinical leaders. But you'll make them for the right reasons. And as long as you can defend the reasons, what more can you do? So, so try not to worry so much. A lot of people I have trained in the past worry an awful lot about their careers and the NHS and what's going to happen in general practice. <laughs> And, oh, God. But uh, it's never helped me at all, worrying. So worry less. Um, read more. Read more books. Balzac's great. Sounds a bit pretentious, that. But he's a really good writer. He writes about human people, human conditions and people suffering. And it's just like the GP practice. So it, read more. Um, have a varied social circle, because otherwise you'll just go to dinner parties with doctors. You're very dull. Um, but also, as doctors, you will meet all kinds of people, and if you, have, if you have experience of other people in other parts of your life that allows you to have a bit more insight into why these people are suffering or why they're frightened, it'll really help you. It's helped me a lot. And um, the last thing is develop mentors. I, I'm constantly looking for mentors. I've learned a lot from my registrar. She's had a very varied career. I won't embarrass her, but she's, she's taught me lots of stuff. In a way, she's like a little mentor amongst my group of people that help me. Um, and don't be afraid of, of taking over leadership roles, because that is why you've trained, that is why the government has invested all this money in you, that's why you've invested all this money in you. And as leaders, you will have a greatly rewarding career. <laughs>